Good afternoon. It's great to see all of you here. And uh, today we are very honored to have Mr. Manuel Muniz Via, the Provost of IE University at Watson campus. And I think uh, it's been a very exciting day because we have covered a lot of activities ranging from uh, a conference to a plenary session to an interaction with the students. You have met some faculty. And now I think uh, it would be interesting to delve deeper into the global politics a little bit more and also understand a uh, bit more on the higher education landscape, especially with Spain and India as a focus, right? Uh, so, Mr. Muniz, uh, you know, my first question to you would be on the current affairs, especially in the higher education space. How do you see Spain progressing uh, with regard to, you know, developing not just its curriculum, but I think innovative curriculum uh, with keeping in mind that, you know, we need to incorporate SDGs into our curriculum. It's, it's been a talk of the town for quite a while. Uh, United Nations, uh, Prime, uh, AACSB, EFMD, all the accreditations and ranking bodies have also stressed upon that. Uh, so my question to you is, as IE University, uh, what are some of the initiatives being taken in order to revamp your curriculum? So, um, well, it's, I mean, I'm delighted to be here. The, um, I'll be sharing this as well with the, with the faculty later, no? but uh, this idea that when you think about the future of academia and the role of higher education institutions, I think it's useful to think about the environment where we live. And I think the environment is very shaped by three fundamental forces. One is uh, velocity. So the world is changing ever faster. And that is a consequence, as I mentioned here, of technology and innovation fundamentally, but also other forces. And that, that I think, means that universities, A, need to introduce the content of tech and innovation throughout their programs. So if you exit university without having digital skills, the capacity to engage and interact with software and with hardware in a consistent way, uh, or you exit academia without knowing the impact that technology is going to have in your field, I think that's going to be a big issue for you further down the line. Um, it also means that we need to do much more foresight in university. So we need to be able to look forward and do scenarios and think about the future. Uh, much more than we did some years ago. So just think about the future, think about scenarios and progress and try to adapt to it. I think this having this foresight mentality is big. The second element of change I think is complexity. So we face incredibly complex challenges. We were talking about climate change just a little while ago. I mean the climate challenge basically forces us to engage every discipline from the scientific fields, from sociology, from politics, from economics, engineering. I mean, it's extraordinarily complex if we want to address it properly. And that calls for interdisciplinarity. And then finally, I would mention interdependence as the third force. So what happens in India, what happens in China, in Wuhan affects the rest of the world, or what happens in the Amazon basin affects the rest of the world. So. We need universities that are truly global, that can address the local issues and the global issues uh, indistinctively. And that's the way we think about the function of academia uh, and the environment that we inhabit at IE. I'll mention just the one initiative, because you mentioned the SDGs and the UN. And this, we have a very important partnership with the UN system and with the Secretary General's office. And that has led to the launch of a number of programs, of training initiatives, of research initiatives with the UN. We work particularly closely with the UN Staff College. And we have built a master's in development with the Staff College. And we're trying to help the UN system do the upskilling and upgrading that the Secretary General has set for the, for the system, which is captured in the Quintet for Change. And he speaks, in fact, of foresight, of data analysis, of behavioral sciences. You know, all of these of innovation, these axes for upskilling of the UN system. Uh, but that's the environment we think we inhabit, and that's the university we're trying to build. 
Absolutely. I think it's, it's quite interesting to see what IE is doing, especially uh, on the SDG front. Uh, as Watson, we've been following your journey uh, uh, for quite a while, and we're very impressed. Uh, just to add on to what you've mentioned uh, on the various initiatives, Watson, as a university as well, uh, we run various initiatives. Uh, we do have a center of excellence on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, you know there are various projects being undertaken in the name of project inclusion, project aspiration, uh, which are nothing but some initiatives being taken to uplift the rural belts in the state where we are located, and empowering not just the women, but also the, uh, the underprivileged sections, the, you look at the marginalized communities, you look at uh, you know, people coming in from various uh, walks of life, it could be... Now, when we talk about LGBTQ, I think, uh, you know, we, we also need to look at people coming in from other, uh, uh, other walks, like, for example, people from the military, people who are uh, retired, uh, people who find it difficult. So, as a university, we are taking various initiatives to, you know, uh, invite them to the campus, make them aware, uh, run multiple initiatives with the students where they're coming in, uh, guided by the faculty. So, I mean, these are just some of the uh, initiatives, but uh, we are a prime champion school ourselves, uh, Watson School of Business, and in, in the last two years, what we have seen is there is a growing interest uh, from the students as well as from the faculty side to give back to the community. And India is a big market, as you can understand, considering there is a huge uh, rural uh, population which needs more access of education, needs more access of the technology, the emerging technologies. I mean, we are living in the age of metaverse, but l imagine the, the section of the people who are just near to our vicinity. I mean, two kilometers on the right, two kilometers on the left to the campus, we, we look at people who are uh, not having even basic computers, right? So. That is what our focus is to not just build the institution internally, but also ensure that we take the people along in our journey. Uh, my, my next question to you, Manuel, is about uh, your journey specifically. I mean, you've you know, had a fascinating career, especially in uh, the foreign ministry as well in Spain, uh, where you served as the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. uh, what were your key impressions about India when you were serving in the ministry? And what have been some of the changes that you see, especially when G20 was conducted recently in, in, in Delhi? Uh, were there any key drivers that you found that India is taking a lead in bringing the world together? So my time at the foreign ministry was very conditioned by COVID because I went into the ministry in January late January of 2020 and by March of that year, so basically a month into uh, the tenure, we had been hit by COVID very hard because Spain was hit hard and early. So my tenure was very conditioned by COVID. Um, but already during my time, it was very evident that India was on the rise, um, that it was going to be a pivotal player. I happen, I happen to think that India is where China was in 2000 and 2000, 2006 or 2007. So it's right in this moment of the ramp, sort of the lift off ramp uh, in terms of economic growth. Um, so I'm very bullish on, on India and I think it's going to be a very uh, important partner for Spain and for others and not just on the economics like we discussed before, also on the diplomacy and on the geopolitics. I think it's going to be a fundamental actor in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so, you know, it was a priority for us to engage with India, and I think it will continue to be for governments moving forward in Spain. Um, we began attending at the minister's level, for example, the Raisina Dialogue in Delhi, uh, before, right, right before my time. So the, the previous foreign minister to the minister that I worked with had already attended. And the idea was to keep that in place and continue to come and engage with the system here and then do bilateral consultations, which we do um, at a vice minister level. So yeah, the idea was, the idea was to, uh, to remain engaged in the region and with India in particular. 
One of the things, by the way, that I didn't realize during COVID is how important India is in the manufacturing of um, all sorts of health products, uh, including products for the lab, and then ultimately as well for vaccines, because uh, we sort of, all of us realized how our supply chains were interconnected and how most of our health, uh, pharma and health supply chains are connected to India. But that's a bit anecdotal, but it was very relevant when, we, when I was there. India was there uh, helping the world at that time, in difficult times. I think uh, we had some exciting role to play uh, at that uh, period. My, my next question to you, Manuel, is more on the lines of, uh, you know, investments, on trade and investment specifically. Uh, how do you see uh, Spanish companies taking interest uh, to, you know, delve deeper into, uh, you know, getting their bases uh, set in India? Uh, do they see India as an attractive destination to build their uh, ventures and uh, are more and more startups showing interest these days to come and participate in India rather than looking at any other uh, Asian country? Not enough. I, I think not enough. I and mean, if you look at the investment figures, most of Spanish investment is concentrated in EU countries, Latin American countries, and the United States. I mean, that's basically the distribution of our investment. So one of the goals, because uh, I, I used to um, run the economic diplomacy of uh, the ministry, uh, was to try to expand the destination and direction of our trade and our investment, both things. And I think that there's still a long way to go there. Um, and I think there are barriers, there are barriers of knowledge of India, there may be some language barriers, still because English is widely spoken in Spain, but I think that that still plays definitely against uh, the investment trends and has played in favor of Latin America, where we hold immense uh, stocks of investment, Brazil, and Mexico, and Argentina, and Chile, I and mean, these are Colombia, these are big investment markets uh, for Spanish banks, for Spanish utilities, Spanish telecommunications companies. I mean, they're, they're all very present in Latin America. So I think that there's space there for improvement, and this should be done through economic diplomacy. I think the G20 helped, and I think uh, that uh, all of the international leadership that India is uh, displaying will facilitate uh, the business investment. So I'm, I'm optimistic that this will develop upwards in the coming years. No, that's, that's really optimistic to look at, uh, especially on how do we see uh, India-Spain ties going forward uh, in the economic side. But my, my next question is more on the higher education side. Uh, I've visited your campus. Your campus is beautiful. I mean, you've got some amazing uh, architecture in Segovia and your uh, campus in Madrid is exceptional. I think uh, more and more of you that uh, is looking to travel to Spain and specifically, you know, in Europe anytime, I think you should definitely go over to Madrid and visit their beautiful IE Tower. Uh, we, I did find a lot of uh, nationalities. As you mentioned, 83% uh, of your student population is international. Uh, Waxen being a young 10-year-old uh, institution, we are striving towards building that international base in terms of full-time degree-seeking students as well as uh, exchange students too, as well as increasing our diversity of the faculty. Uh, what would be your advice uh, to a private university like us, which is rapidly growing uh, in a market like India, uh, but has the, the thirst to bring the best from across the world, specifically, you know, uh, all nationalities, the West to India and experience and get them experience to uh, what we have to offer. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the first piece of advice would be on innovation and technology. I think uh, traditional academic institutions, I think, have a harder time of incorporating some of the frontier topics uh, into their curriculum. And I think younger universities, I think, have maybe greater margin of maneuver there. So I would, I would put a big focus on tech, innovation, entrepreneurship in all of your programs, not just the business programs, but across the board. Um, I think that's a, that's a huge plus in general terms. Um, I also think that having a connection to the business world, to the world of practice, so business, government, uh, multilateral institutions, 
but not just a connection in the sense that they come to campus or you talk to them every now and then. I mean, real, real partnership with these institutions, which we have also aimed to build, I think is extremely useful. Uh, so have them look at your program design, come in as faculty, uh, engage with the careers office. You know, I think this is also a strength of younger institutions that sometimes we're less detached from the world of practice. And that provides, I think, for greater employability, greater, uh, you know, if you have an entrepreneurship space, which I've seen that you do, and you, that also means that you're offering a, a sort of a ramp for your startups to then be connected to the real world, um, maybe to investors, maybe to be purchased, or uh, to yeah, gain clients. So this issue of the applied nature of learning, I think, is something to, to, be, to be really ingrained into, into the programs. No? Um, I think those are two fundamental strengths of many younger, uh, younger institutions. And then lastly, if I do know this, is engage globally in a very intense way. Because internationalization is, is also a product of your engagement. You know, partnering with other institutions, doing exchanges, building collaborations of different types. I think that's essential if you want to be better known and you want to bring an international cohort into your classroom. So we have, for example, something that uh, is not that well known, but it is fundamental to us. We have uh, over 30 offices open abroad permanently. So we have just under 300 people uh, in our staff are employed outside of Spain. And they're there to engage with other institutions to help uh, inform potential candidates of our programs. They manage our alumni community uh, in these places. So, you know, this is a huge effort. So that, that figure of 80 something percent of international students is a product of a, a very structured strategy of diversity in the classroom, right? Uh, so that would that, be my third piece of advice. Great. Uh in fact, just to add on to that, uh, what Watson has been doing is uh, in order to, you know, I mean, for us as an institution, it has always been easier to get students and faculty from across the neighboring uh, countries, uh, especially in the Middle East and the other Asian countries, uh, and people from the Indian origin, students from across the US and, and the UK as well. Uh, however, to attract more of European and uh, the American students, as well as people from across the, uh, the, the other continents. The idea for us is we've started a short program on doing business in emerging markets, where, as you mentioned, right, the focus on innovation, focus on entrepreneurship uh, is quite critical in order to bring the best of the world uh, you know, to India. So I think. Uh, we've just started that last year we had, we hosted the Brazilian and Colombian uh, universities, top of the line uh, in, in, in those regions. And this year we are hosting a, a, a university from uh, South Africa, as well as from Brazil again. And uh, the idea is for them to come and experience for a few weeks to, to experience and see what India is doing uh, within a short span rather than looking at spending four months or five months, which is usually becoming very, uh, you know, a long of a duration for, for students to, to, to spend their time. So I think these are a few initiatives that we are taking on the short programs, immersions, certificate programs, uh, you know, looking at uh, stackable micro-credentials uh, that we are offering in, with other, uh, you, know, uh, you know, partner institutions as well. And I, by the way, I, and I wouldn't underplay that. I mean, I think you're very fortunate to be in India, and you're very, you're very fortunate to be in the Global South, and you're very fortunate to be in a country that has um, developed so successfully over the years. So, I mean, you know, you're very fortunate to be geographically where you are, like smack in the middle of the Indo-Pacific. I mean, it's called Indo-Pacific for a yeah. reason. So, you know, I, I think those are also real assets and of interest to folks around the world. Uh, and there are other geographies that are, I'm not gonna mention them, but they're far less interesting, right? I mean. It, it, but this one is fascinating in the world for the world that is coming. So, you know, I, I find a whole avenue of, of potential collaborations built around the fact that, that you're here, that you know this part of the world, the type of economy that India has, and the development history of India. Absolutely. So, I mean, we're done with the first segment of our conversation, but now we move on to the second and the last segment, uh, which is going to be a rapid fire. 
Okay. So uh, this is going to be the Voxen style. So uh, I would suggest we have a coffee right here. So maybe you want to grab a coffee uh, before we move on to the next segment. Okay. So I'm ready. Are you ready? The, the maybe, answers yeah. need to be in just one word or maybe okay. one sentence or maybe you need to just pick up one option uh, with the questions that I pose you with. I have, I have no idea what the questions. I have no idea what the questions are. Right? Well, this is a surprise element. Uh, you know, this is the usual Watson style that we host uh, these fireside chats, Manuel. My first question to you is: If you could spend a time with a historical fig uh, figure or a leader, uh, you know, somebody who is living or who is deceased. Who would it be and uh, what would you still want to discuss with that person if given an opportunity? That's a good question. So I, I have just a one word and I, I would say Augustus, Emperor Augustus of Rome. I remember when I studied law, uh, my, my professor of Roman law said to me, I think Augustus is the person that ever lived that was, that was most certain of the fact that he was most certain of the fact that he was changing history because he lived in a fundamental period in, in Rome and in the shaping of the Roman Empire and with it the shaping of a lot of the Greco, Greco Roman cultures um, so that would be a figure that I'd be fascinated to talk to and try to understand his vision for the Roman polity Supposed to be a rapid fire, Manuel, so Sorry. maybe we need to keep okay. it brief. So. <laughs> so, the next question is tell us about one childhood memory that you still have with you and has left a very lasting impression, and you'd like to share that as a piece of advice to our students. Um, you know, I remember very vividly my Christmas, uh, Christmas holidays. This is very big in Spain and we have a celebration called the Three Magic Kings, who were kings that were meant to have gone to Belen, Bethlehem, to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So we celebrate this in Spain. Um, and the way that this is celebrated is you go to bed one night and in the morning there are presents in the Christmas tree. And you can barely sleep. You know? It's sort of like a very sort of nervous, nerve-wracking night. But uh, I remember sort of a collection of them. And it's a very happy memory of waking up, waking up my parents, my sisters, and going down and opening presents. So I remember that very vividly. Great. Was the most unusual or the most fascinating place that you've ever visited? And uh, you'd like to recommend our uh, folks right here to visit sometime soon? Unusual and recommendable. Uh, well, I, I did visit the North Korean, uh, South Korean border, so the demilitarized zone, the DMC in Korea, which is still an active war zone. Uh, there's a ceasefire, but it's not fully implemented by the North Koreans. Uh, and it's just the strangest place because it's a huge minefield. And in the middle of the minefield, uh, you have a couple of houses where there's a Swedish and Swiss mission which are there to supervise that the ceasefire is being respected by both sides. And it's fascinating because it's the oddest, it's the, it's the oddest place I've ever been to. Uh, you, can, um, you can see a North Korean village in the end, which is a sort of a propaganda village. And war can start at any moment. And it just it feels very strange. And by the way, the, Swiss, the Swedish and the Swiss have basically built a small sort of uh, living area with green grass and then you have these, these fences and uh, uh, on the other end is a minefield so it's surreal. Great, so maybe uh, the next time if you're going to Korea you should look at visiting the border as uh, Manuel mentioned. You need to get the military to invite you but it's, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. Great, uh, three key learnings you've had from COVID-19, just one word for each of these three learnings. Okay, so modesty is one. So listening to the experts, uh, resilience was another, and effective communications and bringing everybody on board uh, with your response. Amazing. If you could have had a superpower for a day, what would it be? And what would you do to make a difference in the world? A 
superpower. Just for one day, is it? Yes. I would, I would aim to end uh, poverty. I think poverty, deprivation, uh, the lack of access to basic resources is a huge challenge still. So I would, I would, I would aim for that. And that would be a very useful day for everybody else, I, I expect. I see. If you could share a, a funny or an embarrassing moment from the past that still brings a smile on your face and you'd like to share with us. So this is knowing Manuel Muniz uh, from the Watson platform, I think. These are some questions which the world also needs to know, apart from the usual politics and the academic uh, side of what we hear from you, usually. An embarrassing moment. I mean, my life is it, full of embarrassing moments. <laughs> uh, you know, you have the formal facade and then the, the rest, but um, one that has been particularly embarrassing well, I mean, this is silly, but it happens to me very often. I don't know if it happens to the other Manuel in the room, but for some reason, my name keeps on being confused with Miguel. Mm -hmm. But this happens two or three times a day <laughs> to me. Uh, so I've come to re react with the same enthusiasm to my name. So you can call me Miguel if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so all right, not Miguel. Just a it happens all the time. Does it happen to you as well? Yes. There you go. I don't know. There's something to Miguel and Manuel. You know. All right, Miguel. Yeah, oh, sorry. Manuel. <laughs> Not to worry. So with that, we come to the end of the second segment. And uh, the penultimate question before we end this fireside chat is, what are your views on IE Watson partnership going forward? And how do you see this develop? Uh, this is the first part of the question. And the last question being, how do you see Watson University grow? And what are your initial impressions about the institution? So I'll, finish, I'll start with the second one. So my hope is that Watson does very well. Uh, my initial perception is that India needs institutions like Watson. Uh, it needs institutions that can train uh, interdisciplinary, problem-driven uh, leaders that go out into the private and the public sector. I think India's development, if it has a, a bottleneck or a challenge, is a human capital challenge. So I really hope that Watson does extraordinarily well. Oh, and you hit it out of the park and, and you become one of the pieces in the Indian, in the Indian puzzle for, for huge development. You know? uh, in terms of Watson IE, we have an exchange program. So my hope is that that grows and that we have students coming and going in both directions heavily. We have already partnered on strategic initiatives like the Tech for Democracy uh, uh, venture day that we run in Delhi. And I hope that we continue to partner on that intersection of topics of technology business, technology society. So that's my, uh, that, that's my hope moving forward. And that we also partner on this broader initiative of making Spain better known here and India better known and understood in Spain. And I think that that can be done through the engagement of our faculties, uh, the engagement of the leadership of our institutions. Um, so that is, that is my hope. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure having this conversation with you.